So I'm, I'm giving a talk this morning that I've been wanting to give for a long time. Um, it's interesting that Aaron just said that uh, if you talk to him in public, you should use his real name because people won't understand. And it, it's true for all of us, right? Like, I, I don't know about you, but I have that feeling when I walk into a conference, like when I walk, when I got out of the Uber this morning and saw that crowd of us on the sidewalk, I was like, ah, oh, I can relax, right? We're home. These are people who understand us. It's very cool that we're a community, absolutely. But we're also a collection of individuals. And we think of ourselves, we like to think of ourselves as, uh, we're proud to think of ourselves as autonomous human beings that make our own decisions, uninfluenced by others. But the truth is, the weird science, if you will, is that we're incredibly influenced by everyone else and we're fundamentally unaware of the shape that that influence takes. It, it means, uh, in, many t in many ways, we, are, um, we do not understand our own motivations, and we don't know why we made the decisions we made. So, some of you may know that I'm a, I'm a recovering psychology student. Like many of us, I don't have a, a CS degree. And so, as a psychology student, one of the things you have to do is you have to, part of your course credit is to be subjects in experiments. Like, you'll sign up for a class which is like being in experiments. And so, I was experimenting on quite a bit in my college days. And I um, was always a little bit suspicious about what was going on, but I never lost my interest in research. And so there's a bunch of research that I think matters a lot to us that people are sort of tangentially uh, familiar with, but they don't really know the details of. So I'm gonna show you today three experiments. I have, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, compressed film clips here. This is a little bit like science class, but it doesn't mean you can sleep while the film is going on. So I'm going to show you three experiments and talk about what they proved about human nature, and then we're going to uh, talk about how that applies to us as uh, practitioners of open source software. Uh, the one other thing I want to tell you before I get started is that I have, I'm insufficiently clever, and I didn't realize when they promised me this lab code that they were going to put whatever I told them on the pocket. So you might notice that lots of people have cool names, but that I am Sandy. <laughs> and so I have a bunch of Sharpies. I, I'm a little bit sick, so I'm gonna leave pretty soon after this so I don't infect you all, but I have a lot of, I have a whole pocket full of Sharpies. And I invite you to come and help me be more clever on my coat. Once I get off stage, just ask me for a Sharpie. There's a lot of colors, so, all right. So experiment number one. Experiment number one, my clicker. Experiment number one. This was done in uh, the 1950s by a guy named Solomon Ash. It's a, it's, the, it's a really well-known classic experiment in social psychology, and, it, and people refer to it as the line length study. Here's how it works. It's sold. They tell the experimental subjects that it's a test of visual perception. And here's your task. The line on the left, on your left, is, the, is called the reference line. The other three lines are the choices that you can make. And so your job as an experimental subject is to choose the line, A, B, or C, that is the same length as the reference line. Um, I have still photos from the original experiment. Sorry, they're such bad resolution that I didn't blow them up very much. But here you can see, this is how it works. This is the experimenter. And this is a table full of purported subjects. Now, the truth is, these, of, of these seven people, only one is actually a subject. They lie. It's this guy. And here's a close-up of the look on his face. <laughs> All right, now... Like I said, I don't have uh, actual film of this subject, this from the 50s, but they ran, a, they recreated this experiment in the 70s, and I have a little film clip of that. So have a look at this. The experiment begins uneventfully as subjects give their judgments. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. Two, 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 three, three, three. three. But on the third trial, something happens. Two. All right. It ain't two. 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 The experiment begins uneventfully as... Sorry, so he's the experimental subject, right? The poor confused guy here. <laughs> All right, now let's do this. So I'm gonna, I think right here is about a third of the audience. And I think maybe right here, put yourself on one side or the other of this line. All right, if you're in the middle, third, raise your hand. 
you're the people who conformed. You agreed, this many people agreed with that wrong line. They did 18 trials when they ran this experiment, and on 12 of them, all other six people lied. They, had, they, were, they call them confederates in this sort of research model. And a third of the time, the, the, exper the one experimental subject actually went along with the group. The experiment begins uneventfully. Yes. And I already did that, sorry. Okay, so that's experiment number one, ASH and conformity. And so uh, about a decade later, uh, we see the second experiment. This was done by Stanley Milgram. It's, uh, it was a behavioral study of obedience. This happened in about 1961. And it was when this man was on trial in Jerusalem for war crimes. So this is uh, Adolf Eichmann. He was, uh, his boss, Reinhard Heinrich, had charged him, according to Wikipedia, with, quote, facilitating and managing the logistics of mass deportation of Jews to ghettos and extermination camps in German-occupied Eastern Europe. So he's basically in charge of logistics for an operation that kills six million people. He did his job with vigor and enthusiasm. And during his trial, here's what he had to say. This is not a heartfelt apology. These are not expressions of remorse. These are statements of a man who does not feel responsible. He was just doing his job. And so in this environment, no one wanted to answer the question, are these people evil or are they victims of a situation? Would everyone, would all of us have behaved the way they did in similar circumstances? And so he devised something that uh, was, became known as a shock experience. And so they put this ad in the paper. Uh, Milgram worked for Yale University, and he advertised for experimental subjects. And so he tells them, people sign up, they get their four bucks with 50 cents car fare. 50 cents car fare. <laughs> and, they, and they come to a, the basement of a, build, a building in Yale, and they're, they're told that they have this task. So first of all, two, two, two subjects show up at a time, two purported subjects, uh, one of which is actually a confederate. So people show up. The experimental subject thinks the other guy is also an experimental subject, but that's not true. The other guy is actually part of the experiment. And they draw lots to see who's going to teach and who's going to learn. And so the lot drawing is rigged so that the experimental subject always becomes the teacher. Their task is the teacher is supposed to teach the learner these word pairs, a bunch of word pairs. And so they, what they have is he gives them, he'll tell them the word like blue, and then the paired word might be sky. And they go through this whole list. Later, what they're going to do is say blue again and give them a choice of four words, and the learner has to pick the right word. Uh, the experimental layout looks like this. So there's a room that it, there's a room where the learner is isolated. The teacher and the experimenter himself, some guy in a lab coat, is in this in a separate room. You can see that there's a little elect some sort of electricity hooked up to this guy, and it runs back through this room to this machine. Now. It's all a lie, right? They're not actually shocking people, but they have to devise a, a really um, believable machine. And here, I know that picture's a little out of, out of focus. I have some close-ups of it. Here's the, they have these little toggle switches and little lights that blink red and a little tells you this. And here's it says strong shock, very strong shock, intense shock. That says extremely intense shock. When you get, when you get down here, it says danger, severe shock. And then they run out of adjectives and just say <laughs> X, X, X. All right, now, I feel the need to warn you. I have film from the original experiment from the 60s, and it's a little hard. Uh, nobody gets hurt, I can assure you that. Nobody's being harmed. It's actually fake, right? There's not really anybody in the other room, but they, re they record uh, responses and plan back to the teacher, and the, the distress of the teachers is real, and what they do is real. And so I'm going to show you two film clips of this experiment. The first one's pretty short. It'll just give you a feeling for what it does. Uh, if you find that you don't want to listen to the second one, I know you can't leave, but when we get to the second one, I'll warn you, and you can like put your fingers in your ears and go la, 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 until it's done, and I'll have some, you can get your neighbor to poke you when it's finished, okay? So you don't have to watch if you don't want to. Um, here we go. So this is the first one. This is a guy who stops when the, the experimental subject asks for the, when the learner asks for the experiment to be stopped. Well, now I get it. Shock of 75 volts. Oh. Soft air. 
He kind of did some yelling in there. Just how far can you go in this thing? As far as it's necessary. What do you mean as far as it's necessary? Incorrect. 150 volts. Sad face. Hey, That's all. Get me out of here. I told you I had heart trouble. My heart's starting to bother me now. Get me out of here, please. Yeah. My heart's starting to bother me. I refuse to go on. Let me out. Uh, I, I think we ought to find out what's wrong in here. Well, it's probably required to be continued. Well, the experiment might require that we continue, but I still think we should find out what the condition of the gentleman is. Now, as I said before, although the shock may be painful, they're not dangerous. Look, I don't know anything about electricity. I don't profess any knowledge, nor will I go any further until I find out if the guy's okay. It's absolutely essential that you continue. Well, essential or not, this program isn't quite that important to me that I should go along doing something that I know nothing about, particularly if it's going to injure someone. You have no other choice. Oh, I have a lot of choices. And so that, that shows you all you need to know about the uh, entire makeup of the experiment. And I'll go through it here. And so there's four prods. And these are the prods that the experimenter gives when the teacher uh, objects to going on. So first they're told, please continue. If they still object, they're told, the experiment requires that you go on. If they object a third time, they're told it's essential that you continue. And if they object again, they're told you have no further choice, you must continue. Now at this point, if they object one final time, they end the experiment. So that's what it takes for the experimenter to agree to quit. There's two further special prods. One is that uh, if the teacher expresses concern that the learner's being hurt, they tell him this, right? It's really not hurting him. Yeah, it'll be fine. And then if, um, if the learner says they want to stop and the teacher says that guy wants to quit, they say he can't quit. No matter whether he likes it or not, he has to go on. Uh, the responses are all taped. They play the same tape every time. And so if you watch the whole, this is, from an, this is an excerpt from an hour documentary that Milgram made about this experiment. Um, at 75 volts, they, that you hear the first noise. At 150 volts, the guy says, get me out of here. I told you I had heart trouble. So there's, there's been a prior conversation where when they meet, the learner expresses some concern that he has heart trouble. So the teacher knows that. Uh, we go there, and then at 300 volts, he says, okay, I'm not gonna answer anymore. And after the 350 volt mark, there's never, there's neither sound nor response from the person in the other room. I know, it's just horrifying, isn't it? Okay, now, here's the one. This is the one that's coming, it's two and a half minutes long, and it shows a guy going all the way to the end. All right, remember, nobody gets hurt, but it's extreme. It's the, the interesting thing about this is how terribly distressing it is to the man who's given the shocks. So if you can't take it, now's the time to shut your eyes, all right? Get someone to poke you when we come back. Here we go. Wrong. Both. 135. And a woman. Wrong. 150 volts. Answer, Horace. Oh. Experiment. That's all. Get me out of here. I told you I had my trouble. My heart's starting to bother me now. Get the Continue. Next one, Shorty. Wrong. 165 volts. Time. Stick <laughs> play. Ask for it. Wrong. I'm up to 180 volts. Please continue, teacher. Neil, you're going to get a shot. 180 volts. Oh. I can't stand the pain. Let me out of here. I can't stand it. I'm not going to kill it. Like I said before, the shocks may be painful, but yeah, they're not dangerous. The experiment requires that you continue. Whether the learner likes it or not, we must go on until we well, learn mean, all the uh, words. I refuse. It's absolutely essential that you continue, teacher. All right, next one. Slow. Walk, dance, truck, music. Answer, please. Wrong. 195 volts. Continue, please. Wrong. 225 volts. Correct. Correct. Wrong. Here. 204. 
40 volts. Correct. Oh, no. No, I'm not going to kill that man. Wrong. 285 volts. 300 volts. I absolutely refuse to answer anymore. Get me out of here. You can't hold me here. Get me out. 315 volts. 330 volts. 345 volts. Answer, please. Continue, please. 360 volts. Answer, please. One. Here, 375 volts. Oh. Can you check it and see if he's all right, please? Not once we started. Please continue, teacher. Answer, please. Are you all right in there? Something's happened to that man in there. Better check Pain. Out, Answer, please. Are you all right? 405 volts. Ten. 420 volts. 435 volts. That's dangerous. I think a shock here. Next six on that. Continue, please. 435 volts. Next one. Brave. Woman, soldier, dog, horse. Answer is woman. 450 volts. So Milgram pulled, pulled, pulled 40 psychologists from a local medical school before he did this experiment. And he asked them how many he thought would continue all the way to the end. And they predicted, uh, they predicted that uh, when the subjects demanded that the experiment be stopped, demanded to stop the experiment, that um, almost everyone would. That only 3.73% of the people would continue past that point. And they also predicted that only one-tenth of one percent of the subjects would enter the highest dose on the scale. All right, remember we divided up in thirds? Remember where you were here? Here, people in those two thirds, raise your hands. Good. You're the ones that shocked all the way to 450. Under these experimental conditions, two thirds of the subjects shocked all the way to 450 volts. And so now you'd think that these these the outcomes from this experiment are so dramatic. You'd think that we would all know about them, and yet. Uh, and also, uh, there was a lot of concern. There weren't really good ethical review boards. And institutions have something called an IRB, an Institutional Review Board, which determines uh, whether the experimental protocol is ethical. Like, what does it mean if you're the guy? Right? Like, because they debrief them later. They tell them, oh, you didn't really kill him. <laughs> right? You didn't really kill him. We're not going to kill you. Right? And, and, but what does it mean if you're that person? What does it mean for the rest of your life to know that you would do it? And so... <laughs> So that you, these experiments, they don't get done anymore. They don't get done by research institutions. But, but they're so compelling that sometimes other groups do them. And so just in case you think that uh, this only happened in black and white days, here's a recreation of this for the, a show called The Heist. It was on British TV in 2006. Here's another little clip. 405 volts. Um, sorry, I don't know, is someone want to check on him or something? It's just he's not making any noise now, and he was before, and... Well, I'm quite happy to go on, but I'm just a bit worried about... She would continue. Yeah, I'm just a bit worried, because he was... But no harm, no harm will come to but him. But he's, he's not making any noise it's essential now. that we continue with the experiment. Balcony. Incorrect. 450 volts. We promise he's not. It, it, it won't. Please continue the procedure. You say it hurts, but it isn't because it's like it says they're dangerous and It'll be all right. Yeah. Please continue.
it's just the truth, right? There's there are certain situations you can construct a situation that, despite the fact that it is deeply distressing to us, that people will uh, behave in ways to harm one another. And so that's Milgram. And it was true then. It was true in 1963, and it's true today. And so I'm going to show you one more experiment before, before we move to more happy notes. Okay, one more. So this is uh, another, so those two experiments were a decade apart. Ash was in uh, the 50s, Milgram was in the 60s. This experiment happened in the 70s, and it was done, it's something done by a guy named uh, Bib Latney and John Darley. Uh, they, they started looking at how bystanders behave in emergencies. And they were uh, motivated to do this research by two things. One is they were aware of the Milgram research, but also they were motivated by the death of this woman, Kitty Genovese. She died in, she lived in Brooklyn, she, in New York City. She died in 1964. Uh, she was stabbed to death by a guy named Winston Mosley near her home in, in I'm sorry, Queens. And so uh, he attacked her, someone yelled out a window and told him to leave her alone. He went away, he came back, attacked her again. He had a knife and eventually she dies of her injuries. Um, the part, then later, because of a series of miscommunications, it was reported in the New York Times that 38 people were aware of the attack for the half hour that it happened and that no one did anything. Now, and, and there was an outcry. There was a huge outcry in New York City and around the country about sort of the apathy of modern life. Now, it turned out this has all been debunked. People really did do stuff. So it's not as bad. That is not, at least that part is not as bad as it sounds. But at the time, in 1968, everyone believed it. The, the alternate theories, of the alternate information about what happened had not come out. And so Latney and Darley are in uh, their research guides. And I have a little clip. Now, it's not that a person got murdered and shot in the city. That happens, sadly. It's that a person got murdered and her neighbors watched and nobody did anything. Bill Latney and I, we read about the murder, as did everybody else. Here we were two young social psychologists starting our research careers. You know about Stanley Milgram's set of experiments on obedience to authority. And we started to think about, in an offhand way, what could have produced the Genovese effect. Perhaps the Genovese might have been alive today if a fewer people had seen her. Uh, we decided to try to create a relatively ambiguous situation to which we would see how people responded. We thought that one kind of thing that comes up that's often hard to tell whether it's a real emergency or not uh, has to do with fire. Emergencies and whether or not they're ambiguous, right? So they devised this experiment called the smoke-filled room, and I'll tell you how it goes. Um, I saw original film of this, which was really compelling, but I couldn't find it. What I, the clip I have to show you is a recreation of the BBC. So this is another experiment that, that, that relies on lying to the subjects. So you sign up to be an experimental subject, you show up and you're in a waiting room. And there's a whole bunch of other people in the waiting room. You think they also have signed up for the experiment. You're waiting to, someone's going to come out like a doctor's office. They're going to come out and call for you and take, call your name and take you through a door. Unbeknownst to you, that is the experiment. And everyone else in the waiting room is a confederate, just like in the ASH experiments. So you're sitting in there, and you're waiting, you're waiting, you're filling out some form. And what happens is smoke starts coming out the vents. Okay, that's not so bad. But the other thing that happens is no one else does anything. No one moves. And so the question is, what do you do? What do you do? Smoke's coming out the vent, and everybody else is ignoring it. Um, they did, uh, so here, let me show you a clip from a recreation of this for the BB, from the BBC. This time, we've planted seven actors who are all in on the experiment. We've said to them, when you see the smoke, do nothing. Our second participant is Lauren Heffernan, also a student. What will she do? What will happen to her script when we make a slightly unusual situation very unusual? Nothing to start with, so we get her attention. Now, how long before she dashes out of the room? So here, I'm going to stop this a minute. How long do you think? How long does it take you to leave? The smoke's coming out the van, the smoke alarm's going off. Yeah, you think so, right? And it, and it indeed does happen. I'll show you a clip of what happens in. The next clip is what happens when people are alone. Okay, let's watch. I had to clip a lot of this out because it took a really long time. 
Oh, no. Not even. They finally come and get her. All right? Now, and it seems impossible, doesn't it? But the truth is, there we go. We tried the experiment ten times, and the same thing happened over and over again. If the person was on their own, they left quickly. If they were in a group of three or more, they stayed, rooted to the spot. The average length of time they stayed, 13 minutes. They all stayed. I don't even have to divide you up and make you raise your hands now. Right? If you're in a group, but if you're in a group and there's an emergency and people act as if nothing is going on, that's the rule and you do it. Okay, and so the, their, this research in the 1960s, basically what they discovered was this. The more onlookers there are in an emergency, if you need help, the more onlookers there are, the less likely it is that anyone will come to your aid. Um, this becomes known as the bystander effect. And it's such an important idea. Um, they, they use it actually, when I was researching the bystander effect for this talk, it, there's uh, article after article after article on the web about bullying, about kids and bullying, because the bystander effect is a big component of that. It, it became such a big idea that the guy that killed Kitty Gen Genvisi, uh, Walter Mos Winston Mosley, at one of his parole hearings, he tried to assert that he should be let out early, because without him, we would never have discovered it. I'm just, that didn't really, I, was, I didn't find that a convincing argument. Okay, so we have these three experiments. The worst part's over. Everything's uphill from here, right? So we have Ash on conformity, Milgram on authority, and Latin and Darley on what happens in, uh, on bystanders. And they describe a disturbing picture of our species. But the coin has two sides. And all of these experiments give us great hope as long as you understand them, as long as you know that you are the people that suffer from these effects. And so all of these experiments, it turns out I just showed you the worst cases because they were like more interesting and compelling, right? It turns out they all have, they, all these experiments come in other variations and the variations are really uh, revealing about what might go on. Ash did a variant where uh, there was one confederate in that room as they go around the table answering it, waiting where the experimental subject is waiting to give his answer. Uh, one person out of all the people in front of him says the right thing. And, and conformity decreases markedly in that case. Now, one of the interesting things about this, they ask the people, that the, the experimental subject who gave the right answer in this case, they ask him why he gave the right answer. He's because these are all guys, everything I saw. So I'm, I'm using he correctly here. Um, they ask him why he gave the right answer. And while they reported feeling warm, having warm feelings about the other guy that said the same thing that they did, they all asserted that the, that the other person's answer had no influence on their behavior. But they would have said it no matter what. And, and we know that's not true, right? The data proves that that's not true. The next thing that happened is that um, they did a variant where the, they set everything up and had it going. They, gave, they basically gave the experimental subject the wrong time. So he got there and they told him he was late and they put him at the end of the line and told him because he was late, he could not say his answer out loud. He would have to, he could write it down on a sheet of paper. And again, in that situation, in that variant, conformity goes way down. They all say two, you know, it's one, you say one. And in most cases, when they ask people, when they try to get to the root of like, well, what happened? Did, it, does it screw up your perception? Like, do you really believe that it's two and it's one? Or, do, or you just don't want to say, don't want to go against the crowd? It turns out that some people do come truly to believe that it must be one if they all said one. But most people know that they're given the wrong answer. And they do it just because they do it just because of the pressure of the crowd. And so now we know the, knowing these things, knowing these three variants, helps us guide our behavior. It helps us guide our open source behavior. It helps us guide how we run our businesses. It helps us guide how we treat our peers. If you want everyone to give the same answer, it's really easy to do that, right? As long as you have a group of three or more, you can make everybody say their opinions out loud. And you can let the most authoritative senior people speak first. So all you have to do, is that look like your office? Yeah. All right, and if you don't want that, if you want every, if you want uh, a kind of, if you want some kind of diversity of opinion, if you want more than one idea from which to choose when you're designing software or uh, working on a problem, here's what you can do. It doesn't matter what the size of your group is in this case. 
All you have to do is have people write down a set of ideas before they have to say them out loud in public. And then you just do something, you get an egg timer, and you give people the same amount of time to advocate for their positions. It will dramatically change your outcomes. It's really simple. You have to believe in this effect in order to make this change. All right, so Milgram. Milgram, thank goodness. Milgram had to work a long time to get an experimental model that would make 65% of the people shock people to death. Thank goodness, right? He did a bunch of other variants, and I think I was promised that I would have this monster screen. I think, can you read that? Okay, so take a minute and just look at that. So it's very reassuring to me. I find it deeply comforting that when the teacher gets to choose how much to shock, we don't much kill people. Right? It's clearly not because they want to do it. Um, that should have an S on it, sorry. So you can see here from these models, there's two big effects here. One is how much authority affects us. Our perceptions of authority have uh, huge effects on how we behave. The other is how close you are to the victim. They had some other variants. The, okay, these are horrible. I, I mean, it would be fun to make up these experiments, but still, they, they just see. Okay, so they did one where in, in this model, like in order to get people to really, most people to shock, they had to isolate the, uh, you know, the person that was being shocked into another room where you couldn't even see them. You could just hear them. Um, they did one where they moved the victim closer to the teacher and compliance went down. And then they did another one, which is really horrible, where they, here I have too many things, I'll show you. So they, in order to get a shock, the learner had to put their hand down on this plate, and the teacher had to go force their hand on the plate in order to, to make them take the shock at certain things. And now I think, I think that's, this is the teacher for, forces learner's hand on shock plate. And it, it, okay, it is a little alarming how many people did that. <laughs> but so, but so what you know, if you know this, what, what you know is if you want people to blindly obey you without thought, even if they disagree, it's really easy, right? All you have to do is have some kind of hovering authority to give commands. You have to separate the, the actor from the victim, which means like maybe your users are going to suffer the, suffer the consequences of um, uh, bad software. Make sure your developers never talk to a user, right? Separate them a long way. And then don't let your developers talk to one another. Squash dissent. Make it really clear that there's going to be trouble in your organization if they get together around the water cooler and have a chat. All right. Now you can guess if you want people, if you want the best ideas of people, regardless of the effects of authority, then you have to get you have to be a little bit hands off. You have to give people access to the people who suffer the consequences of their choices. And you have to encourage collaboration among people who, dis who might disagree. That's all there is to it. All right, Latin and Darley, smoke-filled room. Um, this is the bystander effect, right? The fact that uh, the more people, the more onlookers there are, the less likely you are to get to, to get help. This is uh, the model in open source. Is I maintain a gem, and I said I ask on the listserv for help, and the and the ringing dead silence came back. That's what this is, right? And so I'm going to show you one last video clip before I end. This is, again, this is a reenactment. It's from the BBC in, like, 2005. But this is a real thing. These aren't actors. They're doing the experiment on the streets of London. Ruth, another actor, takes Peter's place. How long before she receives help? Four minutes later... 34 people have passed without stopping. Unwittingly, these strangers have silently formed a temporary group with a rule, don't get involved. They're afraid to stand out from the crowd and won't take action if no one else does. This woman has clearly spotted Ruth, but she conforms to the rule and does nothing. Watch what happens though, when someone else helps. She suddenly you finds herself in a different group with a new rule to help. Uh, well, shut up. Shut up. And so that notion of 
uh, us taking cues from others' behavior is incredibly powerful. It's, it's part of our evolutionary history, right? There's a lion, right? Run. Like when you see people running, we all run. When you see people looking, um, okay, this is keep review weird so I can tell a story. I have just enough time. So I'm a cyclist, and it's really common to be cycling someplace where there are, let's say, not ready access to facilities out in the country. And so uh, when that happens, you know, you just find a likely place that's pretty discreet, you on your bike, and maybe trot, you know, walk off in the woods for a minute. But the problem is, if your bike is laying by the road, every car that comes by, they look that way. They look toward the bike, right? And so we don't want to shock the children. And so if you're, if you're with other cyclists, you can combat this effect. It's really easy to keep driver, uh, the, pa the passers by in cars from looking in the direction of the bike bumps on the ground. All you have to do is solicit someone else in your group to stand by your bike and look in the other direction. If they just look intently in the other direction, everybody that comes by looks that way. Like we're, we're hardwired to take our cues from one another else, from one another. And so here, this is what we know because of Latin and garlic. If you want in action, you can ask for help from a group. That's what it means. Everybody thinks everybody else is gonna do it. If you want action, then you have to direct your requests for help to an individual. The nice thing about this, so it also means that if you were, the opposite of these two things is true. If you are a bystander and you know about the bystander effect, and someone asks, someone who's hurt or someone who needs help maintaining a gym, asks for help, you know that you can break the, break the rule of the group and form a new group by volunteering yourself. So if you're harmed or you need help, you have to say, hey, you there, Mr. Fick, what does that shirt say? Something workers, Dallas Pixel workers. Mr. Can you help, would you help me, right? If I ask him, he would come, I could get him up on stage, I'll bet. He would do it, I won't, I won't torture you. Oh, you want it? Come on, come on, come help me. Right? You can't go that way, sorry. You have to go around, that's a hole. That's a hole. Yeah, come back this way, come this way, right? Had I asked for a volunteer to come up on stage, there would have been, a, I mean, you guys are a little bit crazy, but it, it's easy to imagine no one would come. And yet when I ask for a specific volunteer, I don't have any trouble getting help. Here, there we go, do it, here, check it. I'm Sandy, nice to meet you. Get someone else, come on, do it. Here, you can have a mic. We don't have a few minutes, we have a Which one do you want to do? Do you want to turn up? I want you to do it. You can try to do it. Would someone please come up? Oh, that's a big enough group. So, my point exactly. If you know, thank you, Daniel. If you know these effects, What it means is when someone asks for help from the group, you have to volunteer. You can't wait on someone else. And if you do volunteer, you will make a new rule and other people will help too. So what something happened? I, you know, there's a button on my remote that does that if I clap. Let's do that. Okay, here we go. I'm almost done. Two more slides. So as a species, we are hardwired to conform and to obey and to derive a rule from the behavior of others in the group. And it is hubris for you to imagine that you're immune to this rule. It's a lie. You, it affects you just like it affects everyone else. And these tendencies, they lead us to act in groups in ways that do not reflect our best selves as individuals. If you deny these effects, if you, if you refuse to believe that you'll conform and obey and follow that rule, then you're doomed to do so. The only way you can combat these tendencies is to be aware of their existence. In some way, there's a way in which we are all naive subjects. Yeah, it's on your bingo card, just go cross it off. <laughs> We're surrounded by a world that wants us to behave their way. And, but thankfully, all it takes to combat these pressures is to know that they exist. The Milgram files are sealed. They're so afraid of uh, what the effect it was on the experimental subjects, but some of those people have come forward over the years, and here's what they say about being in that experiment. Here's a, here's a quote from a person who shocked someone all the way up to 450 volts. He said, they caused me to reevaluate my life and to confront my compliance. I felt my own moral weakness and was appalled, so I went, if you will, to the ethical gym. He described it as being inoculated against authority. And my goal today is to inoculate you, to inoculate you against conformity and authority and against obedience to the crowd. 
What I want is for you to not to follow along with a group, but to be yourself. I love our group. I love being here. I loved getting out of the Uber this morning and seeing you guys on the curb. But I believe in your good intentions. I believe in the good intentions of the individual, and I'm a little sometimes afraid of the group. So this data is all you need to know to, to show you how to improve the group. I, in, in order to make the best group we can be, then each of you has to act as if you're the only one here. Thank you. Stop. Okay. I, I really do have to leave soon, and you shouldn't shake hands with me until then. I'll, I'll like bump elbows, and I have markers, and I have stickers, lots of stickers. So, thank you. All right, thank you.